Welcome to 2024 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Welcome to lesson number nine, titled Blessed is He Who Comes in the Name of the Lord, ready for teaching on March 2. It's from the Sabbath School lesson series on Psalms, authored by Dr. Dragoslava Sandrak and read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, February 24. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we're now two-thirds of the way through this series of lessons on the book of Psalms, that we can still find not only interesting things, but exciting things. And this week, we're studying about Jesus in the Psalms, and we just pray that as we look at who he is, how he was predicted to come and work and live and die and all the things that are so well predicted in the Psalms. Lord, as we come to these, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us. May our faith in you be strengthened. May our faith in Jesus and the salvation that he offers be strengthened as well. We pray, Lord, that uh, as we open your word that those of us listening from all around the world who are studying this lesson may be blessed. And today I'd like to pray for Milimo Habwingo of Zambia and Sandra Robinson and her family and Mara Francis from Jamaica and all the others listening in Jamaica as well and Lisa O'Neill from Ontario in Canada and Corian Brown and Lorna Martin and her family. Lord, we all have our needs, and whatever our needs are, I pray today that each of us, one, may be blessed, and two, may know that you are there with us, and that our needs may be supplied. Be with us as we open your word this week. May your Holy Spirit make the words jump out at us and encourage us in our walk with you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvellous in our eyes. That's Psalms 118, verses 22 and 23. Let's read it again. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvellous in our eyes. The Psalms testify about Christ's person and ministry. Almost all aspects of his work in the plan of salvation are seen in the Psalms. In various ways, Christ's life and work are prefigured and predicted in them, often with remarkable accuracy. The topics revealed in the Psalms include Christ's deity, his sonship, his obedience, his zeal for God's temple, his identity as the good shepherd, his betrayal, his suffering, his bones not being broken, his death, resurrection, ascension, priesthood and kingship. It's all there, as predicted many centuries before Jesus came in the flesh. No wonder, for example, when talking about his ministry, Jesus pointed back to the Psalms when speaking to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. In Luke 24, verse 44, Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. He wanted them to find in the Psalms evidence for who he was. Some of the Psalms that have a typological fulfilment in Christ include Psalm 24, 45, 72 and 101, the ideal king and judge, as well as Psalms 88 and 102, prayers of the suffering servant of God. In all the Psalms, through the psalmist's laments, thanksgivings, praises and cries for justice and deliverance, we can hear the echoes of Christ's prayer for the salvation of the world. Sunday, February 25, Divine Self-Sacrificing Shepherd 
Read Psalm 23, Psalm 28, 9, Psalm 80, verse 1, Psalm 78, verses 52 and 53, Psalm 79, verse 13, and Psalm 100, verse 3. How is the relationship between the Lord and his people portrayed in these texts? Let's start with the well-known Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then Psalm 28, verse 9, Save your people and bless your inheritance. Shepherd them also and bear them up forever. And Psalm 80, Verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. And Psalm 78, verses 52 and 53. But he made his own people go forth like sheep, and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. And he led them on safely, so that they did not fear, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. And Psalm 79, verse 13. So we, your people, and sheep of your pasture, will give you thanks forever. We will show forth your praise to all generations. And Psalm 100, and verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. The image of the Lord as shepherd and God's people as the sheep of his pasture highlights God's guidance and sustaining care of his people and the people's dependence on God to meet all their needs. The image conveys the notion of closeness between God and his people because shepherds lived with their flocks and cared for each sheep individually. The pastoral imagery also underlines God's ownership of his flock, guaranteed by two strong bonds. Creation, as we read in Psalm 95, 6 and 7, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice. And Psalm 100 verse 3 again, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And also covenant, as in Psalm 28 verse 9, save your people and bless your inheritance. Shepherd them also and bear them up forever. And Hebrews 13 verse 20, Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. The image of the divine shepherd who leads Joseph like a flock in 80 verse 1 perhaps alludes to Jacob's benediction of Joseph, which pictures God as the shepherd of Israel and so appeals to this great promise and blessing as we read in Genesis chapter 49, verse 24. But his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From this is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Kings were considered shepherds of their people, we read in 2 Samuel 5, 2. Also, in time past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in, and the Lord said to you, You shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. Yet only God truly deserves this title, because most human kings did not live up to such a calling. 
only Jesus did, which is why he is called the Good Shepherd. Read John 10, verses 11 to 15. What does Jesus say about himself as the Good Shepherd? I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. The intimate bond between the divine shepherd and his flock is seen in the flocks unmistakably knowing the shepherd's voice, as in John 10 verse 4, And when he brings out his sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. To the current day, Middle Eastern shepherds can divide their flocks that have mingled simply by calling their sheep, who recognise and follow their shepherd's voice. At times, God's flock suffers various afflictions that the people understand as the sign of God's discontent and abandonment. Yet, the good shepherd never forsakes his strayed sheep but searches to save them. This is a powerful image of God's relationship with his people. He is willing to die for his sheep, we read in John 10, verses 11 and 15, and paradoxically become a sacrificial lamb on their behalf. We read in John 1, 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Also, Jesus confirmed that he would call his sheep in other folds and unite them into one flock. In John 10 and verse 16, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. And so to finish today, what are ways that you can on a daily and practical level, take advantage of what is promised to us in having Jesus as our Good Shepherd. Monday, February 26, The Suffering Messiah Read Psalm 22 and Psalm 118, verse 22. How was the Messiah treated by those he had come to save? Psalm 22 reads, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear, and in the night season, and I am not silent. But you are wholly enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord, let him rescue him, let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb and made me trust while on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth, from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me, strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet, I can count all my bones, they look and stare at me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. 
But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard... My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. A posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, that he has done this. And Psalm 118 verse 22, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Many psalms express the agonizing feelings of utmost forsakenness of the suffering Messiah. For instance, Psalm 42, Psalm 88, and Psalm 102. Psalm 22 is a direct messianic prophecy because many details in this psalm cannot be historically connected to King David, but perfectly fit the circumstances of Christ's death. Jesus prayed with the words of Psalm 22, 1 on the cross in Matthew 27, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The torment of Christ's separation from his Father, caused by Christ's carrying the entire world's sins can be measured only by the extent of their closeness, namely their unparalleled oneness. As we read in John 1, verses 1 and 2, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And John ten thirty, I and my Father are one. Yet, Even the depths of inexplicable suffering could not break the unity between the Father and the Son. In his utter forsakenness, Christ unconditionally entrusts himself to the Father, despite the utter depths of despair he faced. And in Desire of Ages, page 753, we read, Upon Christ, as our substitute and surety, was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with consternation. End of quote. The threatening animal imagery of strong bulls, roaring lions and dogs highlights the people's cruelty and animosity that Christ, who is compared to a harmless and helpless worm, met in his final hours. With amazing accuracy, Psalm 22 conveys the venomous remarks of the crowd that mocked Jesus with his own words to the Father. Psalm 22 verses 1 My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groanings? And verse 8, He trusted in the Lord, let him rescue him, let him deliver him, since he delights in him. 
And Matthew 27, verse 43, He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the soldiers dividing Jesus' garments. Psalm 22, verse 18 reads, They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And Matthew 27, 35, Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Little did the people understand, then, that the worm they sought to crush would become the chief cornerstone of the temple and secure its foundation. Psalm 118 verse 22, the psalm which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. However, the rejected Messiah became the source of salvation for God's people after his resurrection from the dead. We read in Matthew 21, verse 42, Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. And Acts 4, verses 10 to 12, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Christ suffered the rejection of humanity, but God glorified his Son by making him the living chief cornerstone of God's spiritual temple. We read in Ephesians 2, 20-22, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit, and First Peter chapter two verses four to eight, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the Scripture: Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. For those who reject this stone, namely God's means of salvation, it will become the agent of judgment. As you read in Isaiah 8.14, he will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence to both the houses of Israel, as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And Matthew 21 verse 44, and whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls it will grind him to powder. And so to finish today, Jesus on the cross paid in himself the penalty for every sin you have ever committed. How should the fact that he suffered on your behalf impact how you live now? That is, why you should find sin so abhorrent? Tuesday, February 27, Forever Faithful to His Covenant. Read Psalm 89, verses 27 to 32 and 38 to 46, and Psalm 132, verses 10 to 12. What is the Davidic covenant about? What seems to have endangered it? 
First of all, we read Psalm 89, verses 27 to 32. Also, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. And then verses 38 to 46, But you have cast off and abhorred, you have been furious with your anointed, you have renounced the covenant of your servant, you have profaned his crown by casting it to the ground, you have broken down all his hedges, you have brought his strongholds to ruin. All who pass by the way plunder him, he is a reproach to his neighbours, you have exalted the right hand of his adversaries, you have made all his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword, and have not sustained him in the battle. You have made his glory cease, and cast his throne down to the ground. The days of his youth you have shortened. You have covered him with shame, Salah. How long, Lord, will you hide yourself forever? Will your wrath burn like fire? And then Psalm 132, verses 10 to 12. For your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your anointed. The Lord has sworn in truth to David, he will not turn from it. I will set upon your throne the fruit of your body, if your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony which I shall teach them. Their sons also shall sit upon your throne for evermore. The Davidic covenant contains God's promise of everlasting support of David's line and prosperity of God's people. In 1 Samuel 7, verses 5 to 16, we read, And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together at Mizpah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day, and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. Now, when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel, and when the children of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. So the children of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it at, as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Then Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Now, as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day, and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and drove them back as far as below beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and they did not come any more into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Then the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron to Gath, and Israel recovered its territory from the hands of the Philistines. Also there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. He went from year to year on a circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and judged Israel in all those places. And Psalm 89, verses 1 to 4, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations, for I have said, Mercy shall be built up forever. Your faith Faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David. Your seed I will establish forever 
and build up your throne to all generations. Selah. And the same chapter, Psalm 89, verses 19 to 37. Then you spoke in a vision to your Holy One and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil I have anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established. Also my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. But my My faithfulness and mercy shall be with him, and in my name his horn shall be exalted. Also I shall set his hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers. He shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep for him for ever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure for ever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail." My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne is the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky." And then Psalm 132, verses 12 to 18, If your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony, which I shall teach them, their sons also shall sit upon your throne forevermore. For the Lord has chosen Zion, he has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation. And her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall flourish. The permanence of the covenant was established on God's oath, solemn oath, and the king's faithfulness to God. However, even the devoted kings, such as King David, were not always faithful to the Lord. Psalm 89 laments over the harsh reality that seems to indicate that the glorious promises of the Davidic covenant have been lost. Is Israel hopelessly deserted by God? The answer, of course, is no. God's wrath is, yes, an expression of divine judgment. As we read in Psalm 38, verse 1, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your wrath, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. And Psalm 74, verse 1, O God, why have you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Yet, It does not last forever because God's everlasting love forgives people's sins when people repent. However, while it lasts, God's discontent with his erring people is serious. The people feel the bitter consequences of their disobedience and realize the gravity of their sins. We read in Psalm 89 verses 38 to 46, But you have cast off and abhorred. You have been furious with your anointed. You have renounced the covenant of your servant. You have profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. You have broken down all his hedges. You have brought his strongholds to ruin. All who pass by the way plunder him. He is a reproach to his neighbours. You have exalted the right hand of his adversaries. You have made all his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword and have not sustained him in the battle. You have made his glory cease and cast his throne down to the ground. The days of his youth you have shortened. You have covered him with shame, Salah. How long, Lord, will you hide yourself forever? Will your wrath burn like fire? 
Yet they ask, how long? Appealing to the passing character of God's wrath, as we just read in verse 46. Renewed hope springs from new assurance in God's faithfulness to remember His grace. As we read in Psalm 89, verse 47, Remember how short my time is? For what futility have you created all the children of men? And verse 50, Remember, Lord, the reproach of your servants, how I bear in my bosom the reproach of all the many peoples. In short, although the human component of the covenant failed, the people could rest in the promise of God's unchanging purposes through the Messiah, who embodies all righteousness and salvation of Israel and of the whole world. That is, in the end, God will prevail and his eternal kingdom will be established forever. But only because of Jesus and not because of God's people. Jesus Christ is the Son of David and the Messiah. As you read in Matthew 1, verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham. And Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. He is called the firstborn over all creation in Colossians 1.15, alluding to Psalm 89.27, which calls David, who was a type of Christ, God's firstborn. Also, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Clearly, the title firstborn does not express David's biological status, because David was the eighth child of his parents, as we read in 1 Samuel 16, verses 10 to 11. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him in, for we will not sit down till he comes here. It's the same with Jesus. This title signifies his special honour and authority. As we read in Colossians 1 verse 16, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And verses 20 to 22. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight." God made Jesus the supreme king over the whole world when he raised Jesus from the dead, as we read in Acts 2, verses 30 and 31. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. And so to finish today, read Colossians 1, verse 16, and 20 to 22. And so we'll read that again. Colossians 1, verse 16. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And then verses 20 to 22. And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight.
What do these verses teach us about who Jesus was and what he has done for us? What promise can you take away from this for yourself? Wednesday, February 28, Eternal King of Unrivaled Power. Read Psalm 2, Psalm 110, verses 1 to 3, Psalm 89, verse 4 and 13 to 17, and Psalms 110, verses 1 and 2, 5 and 6. What do these texts teach us about Christ as King? First of all, Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold him in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. And Psalm 100, verses 1 to 3, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness. From the womb of the morning you have the dew of your youth. And Psalm 89, verse 4, Your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations, Selah. And then verses 13 to 17, You have a mighty arm, strong is your hand and high is your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long, and in your righteousness they are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength, and in your favour our horn is exalted. And Psalm 110, verses 1 and 2, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of of your enemies, and verses 5 and 6, the Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. The betrayal of God as the Messiah's father points to the coronation of the king when the king was adopted into God's covenant. We read in verse 7 of Psalm 2, I will declare the decree, the Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And Psalm 89, verses 26 to 28. He shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. Psalm 2, verse 7, foresees Christ's resurrection and exaltation as the dawn of the new everlasting covenant and Christ's royal priesthood, as we read in Acts chapter 13, verses 33 to 39. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that 
He has raised up Jesus, as is also written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And then Hebrews 1 verse 5 For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And Hebrews 5 verse 5, So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. The Messiah sits at God's right hand as someone who has unprecedented honour and authority, as you read in Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. And Acts chapter 7, verses 55 and 56. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look! I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Moreover, the interplay between the Lord and the anointed Messiah even suggests an intention to identify this Davidic Messiah with the Lord himself, writes Jacques Dokan in On the Way to Emmaus, page 26 and 27. If the one who sits at the right hand is the Lord, then the Lord is the Messiah, since the latter is also seen at the right in Psalm 110. End of quote. In the end, Christ will have absolute victory over his enemies. To make the enemies a footstool is an image that reflects the custom of the ancient Near Eastern kings to place their feet on the next of their defeated enemies to demonstrate total dominance over them. Yet, Christ's rod here is not a tool of terror. As you read in Psalm 2 verse 9, You shall break them with a rod of iron, you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And Psalm 110 verse 2, The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. The rod, or staff, was originally held by tribal leaders as the symbol of the tribe, as you read in Numbers 17, verses 2 to 10. Speak to the children of Israel, and get from them a rod from each father's house, all your leaders according to their father's houses, twelve rods. Write each man's name on his rod, and you shall write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi. For there shall be one rod for the head of each father's house. Then you shall place them in the tabernacle of meeting before the testimony where I meet with you. And it shall be that the rod of the man whom I choose will blossom. Thus I will rid myself of the complaints of the children of Israel which they make against you." So Moses spoke to the children of Israel, and each of their leaders gave him a rod apiece. For each leader, according to their father's houses, twelve rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses placed the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron of the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds, had produced blossoms and yielded ripe almonds. Then Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord to all the children of Israel, and they looked, and each man took his rod." And the Lord said to Moses, Bring Aaron's rod back before the testimony to keep as a sign against the rebels that ye may put their complaints away from me, lest they die. Christ's rod 
comes from Zion because he represents the people of Zion. His rod is a symbol of divine judgment which ends the rule of evil and depicts Christ's unrivaled reign. As you read in Revelation 2.27, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. And Revelation 12 verse 5, she bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Even the wicked kings are given a chance to repent and submit to the Messiah, as you read in Psalm 2, verses 10 to 12. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in a way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. One graphic depiction of Christ's ultimate victory is found in the pre-Advent scene in Daniel 7, which shows that after judgment is given in favour of the saints of the Most High, Daniel 7.22, his kingdom is established and his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom in verse 27. Because of the cross, the promise of the kingdom is assured. A blessing is promised to all who trust in the King, and the people rejoice in the Messiah's sovereign and righteous reign. As you read in Psalm 2 and verse 12, Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. And Psalm 89, verses 15 to 17. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long, and in your righteousness they are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength, and in your favour our horn is exalted. And so to finish the day, how nice it is to know that, yes, in the end, good will triumph over evil, justice will be done, and pain and suffering will forever be vanquished. How should this truth give us comfort now when, from a human perspective, evil seems to prosper? Thursday, February 29, Eternal Priest in the Order of Melchizedek. Read Psalm 110, verses 4 to 7. How is Christ's priesthood unique, and what great hope can we find in Christ's heavenly priesthood? Psalm 110, beginning at verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brooks by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. God endows the Messiah with an everlasting kingship, we read in verses 1 to 3 of Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. And a priesthood of a superior rank, the order of Melchizedek, we just read about in verses 4 to 7. The Lord seals his word with a solemn promise in Hebrews 6 verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. God's oath not to relent from giving us a perfect priest is a sign of his grace. People's sins and open rebellions constantly provoke God to abandon his people, but 
God's oath is unchangeable and guarantees God's grace in revoking his judgment over the repentant people. As you read in Exodus 32 verse 14, So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. And also in Psalm 106 verse 45, And for their sake he remembered his covenant and relented according to the multitude of his mercies. The divine oath introduces a novel element to the Davidic covenant by declaring that the Messiah King is also a priest, we read in verse 4 of Psalm 110. Israel's kings could never function as Levitical priests, as we read in Numbers 8, Verse 19, And I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and his sons from among the children of Israel to do the work for the children of Israel in the tabernacle of meeting and to make atonement for the children of Israel, that there be no plague among the children of Israel when the children of Israel come near the sanctuary. And Second Chronicles chapter 26, verses 16 to 21. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. So Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him were eighty priests of the Lord, valiant men. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, it is not for you, Isaiah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honour from the Lord God. Then Isaiah became furious, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense, and while he was angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord, before the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and there on his forehead he was leprous. So they thrust him out of that place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out, because the Lord had struck him. King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house, because he was a leper. For he was cut off from the house of the Lord. Then Jothan, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. When Scripture mentions kings or people offering sacrifices, it implies they're bringing sacrifices to the priests who actually offered them. Psalm 110 sets the Messiah king apart from other of Israel's kings and priests. Christ's eternal priesthood derives from Melchizedek, who was both the king of Salem, that's Jerusalem, and the priest of the Most High God, as we read in Genesis 14, verses 18 to 20. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. The Old Testament never speaks of King David or of any other Israelite king as possessing the priesthood in the order of Melchizedek, except for Psalm 110. Clearly, the psalm speaks about a distinctive king-priest in Israel's history. Read Hebrews 7, verses 20 to 28. What are some of the implications of Christ's superior priesthood? Hebrews 7, beginning at verse 20. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, 
because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those other priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected for ever. Being both divine king and everlasting priest, Christ has unprecedented superiority over human priests and kings, so we may take hope. Christ upholds a superior covenant that is based on God's oath, not human promises. He serves in the heavenly sanctuary. His priesthood is not affected by sin or death like that of human priests, and thus he can intercede for and save his people forever. The reconciling work of Christ as the perfect and compassionate priest gives his people a lasting assurance of abiding in God's very presence, as we read in Hebrews 6 verses 19 to 20. Christ's royal priesthood will abolish the rule of evil, not only in people's hearts, but also in the world. He will keep the promise of Psalm 2 that every nation and ruler will be subject to the royal judgment of Christ Jesus. As we read in Psalm 2, verses 6 to 9, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And then Psalm 100. And 10, verses 1 and 2, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. And then verses 5 and 6, The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. Jesus' wonderful royal priesthood makes an absolute claim on our obedience and trust. Friday, March 1, Further Thought. If you have uh, access, um, we're referred here to a chapter in The Desire of Ages called God With Us. It's on pages 19 to 26. We'll continue reading the lesson here. Being both Christ's prayers and prayers about Christ, the Psalms provide a unique revelation of Christ's person and redeeming ministry as the one who is God with us, as it says in Matthew 1.23. Let's read the whole verse. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Jesus is God with us in the battling prayers of forsakenness and suffering. He is God with us in the cries for justice and deliverance. Jesus is God with us by not abandoning us to our lostness and despair, but showing us the way of faith victorious. He became for us the eternal priest and king to save us from the everlasting doom of sin. In Christ, the perfect Davidic king, all God's solemn promises of salvation find their fulfilment, as we read in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen, to the glory of God through us. 
Ellen G. White insightfully describes Christ's unity with humanity in The Desire of Ages, pages 24 and 25. By his humanity, Christ touched humanity. By his divinity, he lays hold upon the throne of God. As the Son of Man, he gave us an example of obedience. As the Son of God, he gives us power to obey. It was Christ who, from the bush of Mount Horeb, spoke to Moses, saying, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you, Exodus 3.14. This was the pledge of Israel's deliverance. So, when he came in the likeness of men, he declared himself the I am. The child of Bethlehem, the meek and lowly Saviour, is God manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. And to us, he says, I am the good shepherd, I am the living bread, I am the way, the truth, and the life. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, John 10.11, John 6.51, John 14.6, and Matthew 28, verse 18. I am the assurance of every promise. I am, be not afraid, end of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. How has God demonstrated his unwavering faithfulness to his covenant despite the people's unfaithfulness? What reassurance does that bring to God's struggling children today? And two, how does Christ's unique and superior priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek strengthen the certainty of salvation for God's people? And three, The Gospels show that many messianic promises in the Psalms were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. How does this demonstrate the veracity of God's word? Why must we resist any and every sentiment that tends to weaken our trust in God's word? And for what great consolation can we get from Christ's words in Matthew 28:18 All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth how do we apply this promise to our own experience And now it's time for inside story with Sibylla Harold thank you Sibylla Faithfulness Goes Far, Part 5, by Andrew McChesney. During his first few weeks in the military, Sekule was sent with a company of soldiers to work on a mountain in the former Yugoslavia. On a Friday afternoon, he received orders to shovel coal into the Sabbath hours. You have to shovel for 15 minutes, take a 10-minute rest, and then shovel again for 15 minutes, the commanding officer said. I will shovel for two and a half hours without stopping until the sun goes down, but then I will stop, Sekule said. No one can shovel for two hours, the officer said. I can, Sekule said. Sekule, who had learned to work hard while growing up in Montenegro, shoveled as quickly as he could. Other soldiers cautioned him to slow down. Why are you working so quickly, they asked. I'm trying to do as much as I can to leave less work for the rest of you, he replied. I don't care about myself, I just want to do the most that I can. His words built respect among the other soldiers. They saw that he wanted to help them. To everyone's surprise, Sekule succeeded in shoveling the required amount of coal by sunset. But the commanding officer didn't seem to grasp his desire to keep the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, the officer read a list of duties to the soldiers and declared, You will work today. Sekule stood tall. Today is my Sabbath and I can't do any work, he said. He knew that he might face prison if he said this. I won't do any work. So instead, he chose his words carefully and said, I can't do any work. What do you mean you can't, the officer asked. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist and I can't work on Sabbath, Sekule said. The officer stood tall and glared at Sekule. Soldier? Who will work in your place then, he said. All the other soldiers stood tall. We will work in his place then, they said in unison. 
Sukule realized at that moment that it was important not only to be faithful to God, but also to be faithful to people. Jesus said, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these, as quoted in Mark twelve thirty and 31 in the New King James Version. Sekule saw that he treated others fairly, and they also wanted to treat him fairly. Sekule Sekulis is an affluent entrepreneur and faithful Seventh-day Adventist in Montenegro. We will read more of his story next week, and thank you for your Sabbath School Mission offerings that help spread the good news of Jesus soon coming in Montenegro and around the world.